You are gaining nothing. The world is going after him. That is not to say they haven't tried. The Pharisees have conspired against him from about day one, when he first preached at his home synagogue in Nazareth. When you're willing to work with your biggest rivals and your most heartfelt, hated enemies against a common enemy, it shows how desperate you are. They actually work with the Sadducees. They try to cooperate with the Zealots, who are essentially terrorists. They even plot by the end of the Gospel account with the Herodians, the handful of people that support the reign of the Herods. People so corrupt, so few, people who are so tied to the crimes and treason of the regime that they need to stay in power or else they all lose their heads if Herod loses his head. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, the Herodians, all of them with their own agendas, with their own doctrines, their own beliefs, their own, their own lifestyle choices, all of them willing to work together to stop Jesus because he throws everything off the equation. The Pharisees come to exist during the Babylonian captivity, before which time there are no Pharisees. They are interesting in that they are not just a different sect or a denomination of Old Testament religion. They are, in fact, not Old Testament religion at all. God never said to Aaron and Moses to build a synagogue, consecrate a rabbi, to do these rituals that they do. They are completely concocted during the time that they are in the Babylonian captivity when the people of Judah are separated from the temple, from the kingdom of Judah, from Jerusalem. To their credit, they're trying to figure out some ritual, some structure, some means by which they can maintain their national identity while in Babylon. And the same thing will happen to the Levites as they begin to formulate new doctrines, strange ideas, so that the priests of the temple by the first century are members of the Sadducee cult. The Sadducees don't believe in any of the books of the prophets, only the five books of Moses and under a very strict, specific, literal interpretation. Therefore, the Sadducees do not believe in a resurrection. They do not believe that there is life after death and they hold strictly to these five books. God is only God of the living, and you are only under God's reign while you're alive, and when you die, according to the Sadducees, you are gone. To their credit, the Pharisees believe the word of God in all of the books of the prophets, but they too have invented their own institution, their own offices, their own ministry, their own way of doing things, and so by the time they leave captivity and rebuild the temple, these are groups that are in competition with one another, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Our friends, the Zealots, are more unclear in their doctrine. The only thing the Zealots know for sure about their religion is that they hate pagans, and it is their agenda to kill anybody, any way, anyhow, by any means necessary to remove Romans and pagans from the kingdom. They are terrorists. They improvise devices. They do terror attacks. They will come to your house in the middle of the night and kill you for collaborating with the Romans. It's what they do. And as I said, the Herodians, those few that are there, they are noblemen that have so linked themselves to Herod and his relationship with Rome, they must support the dynasty or else. All of these boil down to bad theology, bad religious practice, secular agendas, and ideologies. The confused blending of the nationalism of the zealots, to which it is easy to sympathize. They had a country and they lost it, but the means by which they're using could hardly be said to be religious, which explains why we know almost nothing of what they allegedly believed theologically. They were really a different sort of identity. The Pharisees and their false religion and the Sadducees and theirs are always in a more prominent tension. These are the more prominent sects. They're always fighting with each other over who draws the biggest crowds, who's got more people at the temple or the synagogues, always teaching that the other is wrong. It's easy to be in opposition when there's two. And most of the people in Judah, Judea, the province of Rome and the kingdom of Herod by the first century were sort of eh about religion. This is a huge mission field then for people that are ethnically Hebrew, 
related to the Israelites of the Old Testament for the Pharisees and the Sadducees to be preaching and recruiting and trying to get people fired up to believe in and to follow their sect. It really is so much like politics, but it is a false evangelism. Jesus begins teaching and preaching and the word of God appearing again, beginning with John the Baptist, really crowds of people who hear something different not the self-serving ideology of the Sadducees, not the utter corruption and blasphemy of the Pharisees, not somebody trying to con them out of money or their loyalty or their vote or their support or whatever it is. Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for those who misuse you, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. He says all the wrong things. They are not things that the Pharisees can support, the Sadducees, certainly not the Zealots, and which the Herodians are not concerned with adopting either. Jesus preaches a word of God that we don't like by our nature as sinners. And even the crowds that follow him didn't like. But the power and working of the Holy Ghost is such that it had the reign of truth. When John the Baptist says, you brood of vipers, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? And Jesus says, the kingdom, of, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. We as sinners like to think, I'm okay, you're okay, everything's pretty well okay. What I feel like doing, I should be affirmed in. I should be allowed to do whatever makes me feel good. I should follow what truth as I imagine it. I should decide what is true or not, true for me and do it. But deep inside us, despite the fall in the garden, the law of God, the cosmic moral law, which overarches everything, is written on our hearts in such a way that we can cover it with denial, we can cover it with drugs and alcohol, we can cover it with sex, we can cover it with anything. But buried down there is that seed that says, you're a poor, miserable sinner in need of a God who forgives. And when John the Baptist is willing to call you a brood of vipers and you continue to come back and listen to him chew you out, when Jesus says the kingdom is at hand and you need to repent, change your ways, change what you're doing, live right, and you continue to come back and hear him chew you out, it's because that thing inside that nags is being poked by the Holy Spirit that says this is the truth. The one that tells you the truth is the one that is truly from God. And it's not the Pharisees, and it's not the Sadducees. It's certainly not the Zealots or the Herodians. Let there be no confusion. So therefore, no matter what they have done to try to swindle him, trick him, lie about him, deceive the crowds, do everything possible to turn the people away from Jesus, they keep being drawn to him like planets orbiting the sun because he is God in the flesh, and the Holy Ghost comes out from him and it is irresistible, but then there is still sin, darkness, and the devil. Jesus Christ, God and man, enters triumphantly into his earthly capital, the rightful descendant of David, of Solomon, the rightful king, and yet his kingdom is not of this world. And because he is God, because he is the inevitable winner of all things cosmic, he enters a triumphal parade the week before they murder him. He enters with a celebration of a victory that he already knows is coming, but that the unbelieving world, darkness, the devil, and that unbeliever in us, even the crowd that follows him, will turn against him, does not want to believe in. They celebrate the triumphal parade. If there's anything human beings love, the two things we love most of all is a riot and a parade. There's nothing like a good old-fashioned riot to let out your frustrations, steal some extra stuff while you're at it, and try to make a point. If there really were any aliens flying around looking down, they wonder, why do they, they keep destroying everything and then holding a parade after? Because we also love a parade. Jesus, God in the flesh, holds a triumphal parade greater than any Roman emperor ever had or will right there in their province in the capital of Herod's puppet kingdom. This spontaneous outpouring of support, it is terrifying to all of his enemies. And they say it to one another. They admit their loss. You see, the world has gone after him. But it will not stop them. 
And in this week, we will see it. On the Holy Monday, he took a whip to the money changers in the temple, and they confront him over it. On the Holy Tuesday, he cleanses ten lepers, a symbol and sign of fulfilling the Ten Commandments, building them into us through the Holy Ghost and baptismal regeneration in a way that is new and fresh and not like the dead old law that was corrupted by works by people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And it will continue to escalate till after the Maundy Thursday celebration and the institution of the supper to the arrest, the brutality, the murder of God in the flesh by forces of evil so evil they believe, as his parable predicted, that if they kill the Son of God, they will inherit the vineyard. But Jesus still enters triumphantly the way, the truth, the life, the one that has already, by his, by his cosmic destiny as being God and man, and yet one Christ, fulfilling the prophecies given and the promises by God all the way back to Adam and Eve. This is the descendant of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. He knows what they don't know, that in all of their efforts to destroy him, he will be obedient unto death, and in that obedience, undo the disobedience in the garden and set us free from the burden of sin. The world of the first century and all of those factions I spent time describing could be any time and place in the entire history of the world. Any place where there is heresy and heterodoxy, false doctrine, false teaching, false living, we certainly are living it now and it is not new. But still we gather here in this incredible, miraculous place, the ship that travels between earth and heaven, between time and eternity, where the Lord dispenses his good gifts to those of us still trapped here in this world of shadows and dust, awaiting the day of his glorious return and our own resurrection and the judgment and the new creation, the remaking of all things perfect. He has entered, he has triumphed, he has won, by his death, he overcomes death. By our murder of him, he overcomes us so that he may drown us in holy baptism, killing the old Adam, the sinful man in us, and rising us up to everlasting life. This is the blessing and blessedness of Holy Week. Blessed are they who are called to this sight. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>